All right, we're going to get started because we only have a half hour for this amazing panel. My, my name is J.D. Sampson, and I am on the programming committee for this year's PopCon. Um, I am here today to introduce you to a wonderful panel uh, called Rebel Girls and Grown Women. I will be linking to more information from the site in the chat. Um, you, this panel features the Chicksel Cream, Solidarity, Subversion, and Self-Discovery through the music of Retro Teen, teen Girl Films by Evie Needy, uh, Delty Dusk, Tanya Tucker, Aging in the Cult of Youth by Stacey Easton, and Aging Children Come, Childhood Myths and Realities and the Ground of Creative Genius among 1970s pop auteurs and powers. Um, I believe that they will be presenting in order. And so that means Evie is first. Uh, please uh, chat me privately if you have any questions and looking forward to this. Thanks. Evie, are you ready to go? The chat. She's muted. She doesn't know how to unmute herself. Or she can't. Oh, she's, she's, she's unmuted. She said, I need you. Hey, hi. Oh. Hi. Yeah, I, um, I had accidentally left and then come back. And so I think I wasn't made a host. So I couldn't unmute myself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I will get started because I know we don't have a lot of time. I'm just going to share my um, screen briefly. Sweat. Huh? My tools were out stealing hubcaps. I let it in track. I mean, like, I can't believe it. Danny Zuko turned jock and started it. He's doing deserting us. Boy, you guys can't follow either all your lives, can you? Oh, come on, guys. You know you mean a lot to me. It's just a Sandy does too, and I'm going to do anything I can to get her. That's it. Okay, so um, that is one of my favorite lines in cinema history because it is so perfectly embarrassing. On the surface, it introduces the transformation of Sandy, played by Olivia Newton-John, from the prim and proper prude to sex pot greaser, in a gift of the Magi twist where both Sandy and John Travolta's Danny adopt new identities to get closer to the other. But Sandy, and as all of us who've watched the physical video hundreds of times know, certainly Olivia Newton-John is a huge, adorable dork. She clearly practiced that line thousands of times in the mirror, rolling the dice that Danny would say something to which, tell me about it, stud, is an appropriate response. And the best part is he doesn't. It's a total non sequitur and she rolls with it anyway and gets her man. It's a striking moment that is meant to wow us, but is unintentionally relatable for its awkwardness. A straightforward feminist critique of Greece's finale would be that Sandy gives up her true self as well as a body she's fought to protect in order to appease a horny guy. But I've always seen it as a choice she made to free herself from puritanical expectations, just as her besties, the pink ladies, have been quite defiantly doing the whole movie. Danny has faced real consequences for sexually pressuring her in an earlier scene and wants to be with her without any physical expectations, and now she's calling the shots. As she sings less than a minute after, tell me about it, stud. You better shape up because I need a man and my heart is set on you. Even more subtly subversive is there are worse things I could do, which Stockard Channing's character Rizzo sings after being slut shamed for a pregnancy scare. It reads like a self-pity ballad, but the message is actually pretty radical. 
Isn't it better to have sex with someone you love than lead people on or worse, follow the rules that society puts on women and waste your life? As many of you probably know, Grease is a 1978 film based on a 1971 stage musical set in 1958. Leaving aside for our purposes the fact that every supposed teen in the movie is like 35, it is the Carter era's Frozen in terms of sing-along power, and for many girls of a certain age, well beyond its release, was a tame and tuneful entry-level text about sexual liberation. The title of this talk, The Chicksel Cream, from the song Greased Lightning, is by far the most scandalous line in the script, and probably sailed past most listeners because a mainstream musical set in the 1950s isn't raising anyone's flags. I believe it's the reason that some of the most successful and resonant blockbusters appealing to teen girls have been music-driven ensemble period pieces. These modern stories of female rebellion told through musical nostalgia have given girls a deceptively wholesome context, like a Trojan horse of retro respectability to explore ideas of self-expression and sexual agency. It's an enduring paradox that the interests and preoccupations of teenage girls are generally looked down upon as shallow and artless, while those same teen girl interests and preoccupations drive the pop culture market in everything from music to literature to film. Art that centers teen girl stories and perspectives is particularly powerful and interesting because it can simultaneously be so mainstream and so marginalized. These stories can be as problematic and regressive as they can be empowering and faithful to real experience, but navigating those complications can be inherent to how women understand the context of their lives through art. While the stereotype of an enthusiast who thinks deeply and critically about the art of music and cinema is usually male, no one loves, embraces, and celebrates their movies and their music as hard as girls and young women. And that celebration is collective. A cooing sleepover gathered around dirty dancing or a modern equivalent is part of the DNA of female friendship. When romance, angst, and joy on the screen bring girls together, music in the form of a bulletproof soundtrack is very often a critical ingredient of that glue. Why just laugh and cry together when you can sing at the top of your lungs? I wanna clarify what I mean when I say teen girls because I'm not actually talking exclusively about girls age 13 to 18. Most of the media I'm talking about features teenage characters, but the primary audience I'm interested in is any girl or woman who is at least beginning to identify with the issues those characters and female adolescents are normally concerned with. Crushes and early love or sex, professional and creative aspirations, vanity, body image, self-confidence, either because they're working to summon it or, un or are unable to, complicated friendship, and questioning and resisting authority for cerebral reasons rather than instinctive, like a toddler. This audience can include girls and women as young as about six up to, well, actually there isn't really an upper limit. However, older women's fandom for newer material for young women likely involves memory, nostalgia, and thoughts about how what they're watching will impact the younger generation, rather than experiencing that impact in anything like the same way ourselves. To be honest, my academic preoccupation with all of this has actually flared up in the past several years as an older consumer of media geared toward much younger women, and my ridiculous level of emotion at how fucking good some of it is. I ugly cried watching the new Netflix Babysitter's Club series with my five and eight-year-old daughters, not only because it brought back my favorite childhood book series, but because my pretty young kids finished an episode understanding what transgender means. If my girls see book smart and teen sex comedy blockers before they go to high school, I'll feel like I've done my job as a parent. But back to the musicals. Dirty Dancing isn't technically one, but might as well be, and was just as commercially explosive as Grease, with a diehard middle school audience who now in their 40s casually reference carrying watermelons and can sing the entire Kellerman's theme song. A 1987 film set at a Catskills resort in 1963, Dirty Dancing introduced 80s girls to the Ronettes, the Shirelles, the Four Seasons, and Mickey and Sylvia with a soundtrack, soundtrack that spent 18 weeks at number one on the Billboard 200. That retro veneer under which Baby's primary crime was sneaking out to rehearse a dance routine gave air cover to an indictment of shallow adult expectations and back alley abortions. Even calling it Dirty Dancing proved that it was safe. In retrospect, calling the lead character baby was a pretty ham-fisted way of telling us she's no baby anymore, but we came away with a better understanding that she, and therefore we, did not belong in the corner. This is a short panel, so I'll save some of my rabbit holes about this topic for some hypothetical future book, but I couldn't leave the 1989 film Shag out of this discussion. 
It may not exactly have been a hit, but like its blockbuster predecessors, it puts good girls in 1963 Myrtle Beach, throws in a killer mid-century pop soundtrack and a dance contest, and sullies them with boys in self-discovery. In Shag, sex and sexiness have positive consequences. Bridget Fonda's Malena loses face and a beauty contest by reining in her hot confidence, and straight-laced Phoebe Cates Carson learns how to follow her heart and her wop. Period pieces are really just a subgenre of fantasy in that they romanticize a fictionally more noble time and place. And these days, even the Disney princess juggernaut is shrewdly pushing teen girls agency with the insanely popular Descendants franchise, a musical trilogy that gives the teen children of classic teen, classic Disney villains a second chance. Directed, I should add, by dirty dancing choreographer Kenny Ortega. The boys in the films are fairly well-developed sidekicks, but the heroes are the daughters of Maleficent, Ursula, and the Evil Queen, and even with a fairly standard romance thread involving the hot, kind of dumb son of Beauty and the Beast, the films obliterate the Bechdel test and portray young women as creative thinkers and respected leaders. The music is rock solid, highly addictive pop, and the breakout hit is The Queen of Mean, sung by Sleeping Beauty's daughter, Audrey, when she loses her shit after a lifetime of following all the rules, drawing inside the lines, and never asking for anything that wasn't hers. The key piece here, of course, is that Descendant superfans are in elementary school, and many of them are boys, who at a young age are seeing female protagonists as the default. There are obviously no explicit sexual awakenings happening, but the franchise flips the script on the traditional hero's journey, the girls don't have to pretend to be boys or convince men not to underestimate them to be leaders. They just get there naturally with their own effort and character. As much as I hate to end a popcorn paper by calling Disney revolutionary, I should cut myself off. But despite the fact that where teen girls go, popular culture follows, it's still to me something of a subversive act to acknowledge and invest in that power. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Evie. Uh, Stacy, are you ready? Uh, so I did this on video, and then I realized I had to do it live about 10.30 this morning, so please excuse me if there's any roughness. There will be. <laughs> so I started this paper thinking about Delta Dawn, uh, the Tanya Tucker hit. And I started writing the paper seriously after watching a performance by Tucker singing the song in Hee Haw 1972. Hee Haw is the secret accurate history of American country music, kind of encompassing everything that we are embarrassed of via the genre. Corn poem jokes about horrific, sorry, corn poem jokes about horrific domestic melodramas as a kind of case study in the relief study of humor and the relief theory of humor, made more so because the jokes aren't very funny and the melodramas are so deliberately well-crafted. The art of it provides less relief and more of a kind of softer juxtaposition. In this passage, a Tucker is 13, she's in an orange dress in the prairie style, fronting a full band. The camera moves from a wide shot to a medium shot to a close-up of her face. She keeps singing. Reading the AP and popular press about her concert at these moments in this time, um, and a concert with men like Mel Tillis or Tom T. Hall, who have decades more experience, you get her described with things like, quote, her raw barroom voice, or the little girl with a woman's voice, or that great big voice, or a dynamo, or an ingenue. But she isn't as coltish as an ingenue. She isn't as barn burning as a dynamo. And she would grow into that uh, with a second revival in the early 1980s. Her voice isn't very big. It's clear, precise, but quiet. It would be out of place in a bar room. And so trying to figure out where Tanya Tucker fits in at this moment is, is an interesting problem. So for some context, her dad was a, tuck, was a 
truck driver who figured out Tanya was a better bet to make a living than him driving. So he moved the family around a lot. He grew up in Texas, then some in Phoenix, Nevada, and Utah. She auditioned to be part of the Redford vehicle, Jeremiah Johnson, and got a bit part in such a supporting role that she wanted. Um, and even when they were in Phoenix, uh, her father traveled to Nashville, pushing tapes of her singing. Um, he did this also in Los Angeles. So I keep thinking about, um, sorry, he did this in Los Angeles, and he eventually met Belle Chevelle in a casino in uh, Reno and shoved a tape into his hand, into her hand, into Chevelle's hand. So all that considering, thinking about Delta Dawn is this hassle of super early Gothic songs that she sang in the early 1970s. And thinking they were kind of like Dolly songs around the same time, like Me and Little Andy, or Down from Dover, or Ravine. Uh, but these people either had age or geography on their side. Tucker playing these songs, she's too young for them. And as I said, she didn't play the ingenue, she didn't play young. And they were about the isolation of being a woman and often an aging woman. And so she's almost playing a role, a kind of age drag. So let me break for a minute and tell you the plots of six of her songs that charted in the, in the early 70s, including that Delta Dawn. Delta Dawn. A woman is Jill Tyler Lover, and she spends the next year's 40 years wandering around Brownsville, Tennessee, waiting to return. He doesn't. Um, what's your mama's name? A man named Bruford Wilson spends 30 years asking passerby us who the mothers are after moving somewhere between Memphis and New Orleans. He eventually offers a child a sense of candy to answer the question. He is arrested for inciting a child and spends a month in prison doing hard labor. Wilson dies in poverty in Memphis, where a faded letter indicates the child he was enticing was actually his daughter. Blood red and going down. A child accompanies her father to a bar room where her mother and her lover are congregating. The father shoots the mother and the lover. Would you lay with me? A woman asks for a man to lay with her in a graveyard. Lay with, here being the obvious sexual metaphor, and also something more ghostly. The man who turned my mother on. A travel salesman elopes with a housewife and dies when the child is five. As an adult, the child asks questions about her father. Lizzie and the Rain Man. A rain man, a kind of shamanic figure, comes to visit small town Texas and meets a local woman and they fall in love. So these things have a number of things in common. These songs have a number of things in common. The gothic or the otherworldly, the obsession with loss, uh, leaving or death, uh, a peripatetic movement, especially men leaving, uh, memory or false memory, uh, playing outside of age, and occasionally gender. So there's a nice Freudian connection to made if one considers her parenting, but I have very little time, and so just put a pin in that, assume, and say it. Thinking of other teenage songs who play about sex and death, the fear of death is an early death connected to a transition between adolescence and adulthood. You can trace a thin line between things like Last Kiss, or Teen Angel, or Leader of the Pack, and even... Uh, the song, a uh, relatively contemporary song by Ben Harry, If I Die Young. Tucker seems incapable of being young at all, and I know that's a problematic sentence. But trying to figure out her place in the, in the culture, I keep returning to the cinematic. The closest connections that she makes, how she constructs drama, how she tells stories, even how she embodies the much older are actors in the 1970s and not necessarily musicians. She could be considered a mirror of Jodie Foster or Tatum O'Neill. Think of O'Neill in Paper Moon, older than her time, more reasonable than her age, willing to argue with her father, and the gap between the father and the child, the tension between the child and the adult, is central to the crisis of that performance. Um, O'Neill did not pretend to be an adult, the power was the childhood. But think about the same tension uh, in Jodie Foster, Taxi Driver, where 
where the sexuality comes from, from the child and the sort of scandal of it is, is that she is pretending to be an adult and isn't. Um, or the sort of very weird Bugsy Malone uh, by Ellen Parker, where she's obviously, again, playing an adult. Um, so the, one of the things that these have in common is an ordering, is an odd stuttering start, stop start career not unusual for child stars, but perhaps made more so by how these figures were so far away from childhood uh, from the beginning. Of, so the question becomes of becoming an adult is, is even more difficult. Um, so I'm thinking about this in relationship to Tucker's career, which could be marked as a series of revisions. Thinking about 1981 album TNT, which is a, an exercise in both sort of rock and roll and nostalgia, which he plays songs by Elvis and Buddy Holly, and where she claims adulthood through a kind of listening. But also the 2018, where she finally won the Grammy, where, um, where she finally won the Grammy, where she is produced by Sher Jennings. And so when she sings Delta Dawn, in concert and supporting that album, she's oh, she sings about sort of the age the Delta Dawn would be, and so her concert footage often features conversations about sort of not keeping a man, or often keep, features conversations or jokes about the sort of ambivalence of adulthood, and so it returns back in a sort of looping way to the sort of historical memory of of that space. I find it really interesting as well that she's working with Shooter Jennings as a producer, Wayne's son, and then she's working with the Haggard Boys um, as two musicians or as opening acts. Um, and and so I'm interested in that her role in Nashville then is ongoing, sort of like trying to, to catch up, but she's now in a mentorship role, but because she's all viewed as sort of this ambivalent age, I'm wondering if that's relationship to her, for example, not being in the Hall of Fame. I'm wondering if that's in relationship to her never being steady in, in, in her life, in her career at least. Um, we have about a one minute one. So, and I think that this question then returns back to a question of legacy. Holly Gleason, the writer, keeps uh, bringing up this idea that we keep uh, claim lip service to legend, but they don't sell, they don't move yet. So I wonder what it means, you know, that was performing these songs, finally to late adulthood, that she has aged into the character that she's doing so well. And as a result, she's getting this kind of critical acclaim, but she's not so well as she used to. And I'm interested in that sort of dichotomy of sort of aging out of a commercial success into a, into a, and what, what sort of a legendary success or a canonical success. So that's what I have. Um, I'm done talking, so I'm not sure where about time. I'm probably a little early. Thanks, Stacey. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Thanks to both Evie and Stacey for great talks. Uh, I wish the session was twice, three times as long, because there's so much uh, synergy among what we're talking about. So uh, I'm just going to let JD play a tiny bit of music for one second. Wells of wonder by the throbbing light machine. Welcome in the, the daily trance of the inner child. Orders from the king and queen. Okay, we can turn that down a little bit. All right, so this is a from my an excerpt from my ongoing Joni Mitchell project. Uh, the chapter will eventually include much more than this, uh, including sections on uh, self-help in the inner child, 
children's books, including Anne of Green Gables, The Secret Garden, and Joni Mitchell's favorite, Kim, by Rudyard Kipling, um, Polio and its meaning in her life narrative, uh, and a brief interview with James Taylor. But for today, we're going to focus on <clears throat> the singer-songwriter in general and uh, two contrasting communities, or uh, let's say artificially separated communities and how they address the role of the child. Here we go. And we're at 155, so I don't know. <laughs> that means I have five minutes. Is it okay if I go a little long? <laughs> I'm gonna of just course. go. We're gonna try to fit in a few questions as well. All right, well, I'm gonna jump. Here we go. In 1969, Joni Mitchell recorded an anthem for the blissed out dreamers who surrounded her in the songwriting Circles of Laurel Canyon. It had been kicking around in her repertoire for at least five years since her turtleneck days in the cafe scene connecting Detroit to Toronto. Songs to Aging Children is mu like much early, early Joni, flamboyantly adventurous, an incantatory edict demanding that listeners pause in their cup clinking and listen to folk rock's new profundities. Sorry, I cut out a whole bunch here. Uh, like so much of Joni Mitchell's, of the songs on Joni Mitchell's first two albums, Songs to Aging Children is ridiculous and awe-inspiring, like some scribbling in a college kid's tea-stained notebook, whose every fifth line is a genuine revelation. And thanks, Karen. I see that we, we can run a little a late, late. Thank you. Sublime as its structural innovation may be, it's easy to imagine an older Joni Mitchell chuckling at the gravity of her novice self in a song like Songs to Aging Children. At 25, Joni dreamed of being both ancient and newborn. She believed somehow that her songs made her so. Songs to aging children come, she sings darkly in her lowest register. I am one. An aging child, this music suggested, is a being distinct from the screaming teens whose energy and empowered rock and roll, or the somber, suave, cynical adults for whom music making or loving was a pleasant leisure class pursuit. This spirit was new, yet imbued with ancient wisdom, or wisdom that at least dated from about 1885. In Friedrich Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra, published in 1885, a lion becomes a newborn human by going through a metamorphosis and a struggle with the dragon of moral law. The new being that emerges is free and preternaturally wise. Quote, innocence is the child and forgetfulness, a new beginning, a game, a self-rolling wheel, a first movement, a holy yes. So spoke Zarathustra. How many thousands of students and Bohemians have underlined that holy yes and surrounded it with exclamation marks? Joni read Nietzsche's book, she claims, as a grade schooler, curious kid, pulling something off the shelf in a part of the library where she shouldn't have been. But Zarathustra would have been there anyway in Joni's life when as a young woman, she fancied herself a child again, finding a paperback edition laying on coffee tables in Toronto's Yorkville or Greenwich Village or Laurel Canyon, stacked up next to D.T. Suzuki's Living by Zen and Jack Kerouac's Dharma Bums. The artists who shared Joni's path, forming the new lane of the singer-songwriter, attempted to enact in song the return to innocence these writers described. Describing the sacred creative process, Jody's mentor and lover, Leonard Cohen, once wrote, a man trans translates himself into a child, asking for all there is in a language he has barely mastered. Neil Young, Joni's friend and Canadian homeboy, put it less fancily. I am a child, he sang through his nose like a choir boy. I'll last a while. The task became to carry the child mind into the adult work. The cult of the child was a strong force in the counterculture that coincided with the emergence of the singer-songwriter, connected to both hippie pastoralism and the rise of the pop psychiatric industry of self-help. Adopting a child's perspective became almost a rite of passage for songwriters who wanted to earn accolades for being profound, just as audiences decided en masse that it was possible for messy young people to be so. Bored with the educational vibe of the folk revival, connected to the teen scene of rock, but trying to figure out how to indulge their wider poetic ambitions, singer-songwriters make self-development their métier. In tracing their own growth and making it exemplary, they had to start 
somewhere. So Neil Young waxed poetic about prepubescent fantasies in Sugar Mountain, where you can't be 20. Phil Oakes traced his arduous journey from the tube of his mother's birth canal through other narrowing passages in half a century high. Cat Stevens, Beatles wannabe turned hot sage, uh, voiced the doubts of a young boy leaving home for the first time in Father and Son. I go on quite a long time listing many other songs in which this happened, concluding with Neil Young's Ode to His Childhood Dog, Shiloh, which is a great song. Then there was the music of the men among whom, whom Mitchell lived at the time of her American breakthrough when she became known as a daughter of the prairies, or as one Misty writer put it, the personification of all childhood's sweetest illusion. Girl woman Joni left older man Leonard behind in New York and partnered with a series of increasingly boyish men. Harry David Crosby was soon dumped for Wispy Graham Nash, who lost out to lanky James Taylor, known by the world as Sweet Baby James. He, he was later replaced, though only for an unhappy moment, by wide-eyed Jackson Brown. Joni's image as an aging child wasn't merely an effect of uh, the press's infantilizing sexism. Boys experienced and embraced the child cult too. Then I have a thing about how Jackson Brown wrote like 10 songs about being a child, etc. Okay, and then I have some sort of flowery writing about how these, uh, these singer-songwriters not only talk about being children, but uh, sort of take on the voice of the child in their songs. But we're going to jump ahead to the second part of this particular uh, section, which uh, takes us to another group of, uh, of, uh, of, of artists during that time. While young Joni chased winged Merlins across the Aspen Parkland, or boys on the ice rinks of her native Saskatchewan, Booker T. Jones made his own forays through the yards of South Memphis. He had a paper route to keep him occupied while his mother and father worked at the local high school, a secretary and a math teacher. I looked like a pregnant boy, the keyboardist and producer wrote in his recent memoir, remembering the two huge bags he hung over his 12-year-old shoulders. Deliveries showed Booker T. what his Memphis middle-class upbringing kept at arm's length. As he writes, doors opened by little girls who said, my mama say she not here because no one in the house could pay for the newspaper. A shack where an old man who stank of kerosene lived and looked forward to a brief daily encounter. And quote, sex workers, people with disabilities, homeless people, and church faithful. Jones noticed it all, but the one window where he paused was at the house of pianist Phineas Newborn, a Memphis legend. There he would fold papers and listen to Newborn practice through the window, sometimes for an hour. It would throw off his whole afternoon. Left to his own devices, Booker T. Jones became a listener. I began to absorb all sound, he writes. I heard rhythms in machines, in nature, in the wind. Only five years later, he would infuse what he'd soaked up into the organ parts he recorded at Sax Stack Studios on some of soul music's most enduring hits, including his own instrumental classic, Green Onions. Part of the stew, too, was what he heard of his community struggling. The snarling dogs protecting derelict yards, the sound of police sirens, the jazz music that floated beyond the edges of Lincoln Park, breaking a boundary that the black Memphians who congregated there weren't allowed to cross. Jones's childhood memories connect and contrast with those picturesquely filling in the verses of the folky poets coming out of Laurel Canyon. His path crossed theirs when he moved to Los Angeles in 1969 as part of the circle around Oklahoma transplant Leon Russell, which included his then wife, Priscilla Coolidge. Around that time, Jones produced the first album by a hard to classify artist named Bill Withers, a former factory worker who should have been anointed a poet, but because he was black and Southern and working class, remained on some genre borderline. On that album was a song called Grandma's Hands that beautifully conveyed a childhood view that had room for both nostalgia and painful realism. Withers remembered his dead grandmother offering hugs and candy, but also holding the wrist of his mother who might slap her children when she came to the end of her own rope. Unlike the aging children who played up the forlorn beauty of their green days, Withers had little to say to press about his childhood in Slab Fork, West Virginia, when asked, except that he still enjoyed going back there, and his mother was all right. He was once pushed, however, by a journalist who accused him of not understanding the blues. 
I am the goddamn blues, Withered said. Look at me, shit, I'm from West Virginia. I'm the first man in my family not to work in the coal mines. My mother scrubbed floors on her knees for a living, and you're gonna tell me about the blues because you read some book? Kiss my ass. That flash of anger exposed some realities that were not necessarily universal about black artists in the age of the emergent inner child, but which came through in many of their songs, complicating the idyllic space of childhood memories that the singer-songwriters, the white singer-songwriters were presenting. Uh, their music and life stories, like those told in the new literature of black experience that women like Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou established, didn't obliterate the pastoral landscapes that white singer-songwriters strummed into being, as much as fill in what they often only sketched in corners, the harder realities of childhood in mid-20th century North America, particularly for people of color. And music was not merely a companion alleviating loneliness or enhancing solitude for these aging children. It was a way out of poverty, of overcrowded family homes and into an adulthood that promised prosperity, not just for them, but often for their parents and other loved ones. I'm gonna jump ahead since we're running out of time. I have a section then about the, uh, how often black children in, uh, during the great migration were displaced in various ways, separated from their families, uh, forced to work at a young age and, um, and making a journey from the country to the city that also was a journey into becoming child performers, such an important part of the black American story in music in the, uh, throughout the 20th century, but particularly for artists like Aretha Franklin, Shaka Khan, who uh, started singing in bars at age 11, uh, Roberta Flack, who was a child prodigy, Stevie Wonder. So I'll take it up for this last paragraph um, with Stevie Wonder, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, I, I found a quote. Uh, Okay, Stevie Wonder was signed to Motown Records at 11 and sent out on the road. There he discovered resourcefulness in solitude, but this wasn't the lazy twilight dreaming James Taylor fondly recalls in the North Carolina woods of his own youth. This is Stevie talking. When you are traveling on the road, he told a reporter in 1973 when he was only 23, you have to learn to get to know yourself. Always know where you are as a person, what your likes are. I had to learn this at a very young age and fast. Okay, last paragraph. Stevie Wonder was as spiritual at the turn of the 70s as anyone in Laurel Canyon. And the inner children to whom he gave voice in songs like I Wish or Girl Blue had magical elements. They were golden, playful, just beautiful but they also faced pain and privation. Jimi Hendrix, who struggled through deep privation as a boy in Seattle, struck an exquisite balance among these elements in his song, Castles Made of Sand, his tragic ballad of dreams deferred. The verses move from the adult disappointment of a spurned and it seems unworthy lover through the death in battle of a young, possibly brown man who dreamed as a boy of being an Indian brave, and finally into the childhood of a de desolate disabled girl who mourning her inability to walk decides to die. At the edge of the ocean, Hendrix's cool watery guitar lines evoke Seattle's pearl gray Puget sound. The girl hesitates. Something is on the horizon. Look, a golden winged ship is passing my way, Hendrix sings, his voice cracking slightly, growing younger than his then 25 years for an instant. Is it a rescue vessel or a Feather Canyon chimera? It doesn't matter. It really didn't have to stop. It just kept on going, Hendrix murmurs. The ship is the hope and the delusion of the child who experiences solitude as a contradictory state a burden and a salve, as well as a space of opportunity, a loneliness enforced by racism and other inequities, circumstances created by people, not by some Nietzschean metamorphosis. I am the goddamn blues, Bill Withers had said, thinking about slab fork. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey M and Evie, uh, those were incredible papers. Um, we are going a little late and we've decided to end at 1215 Pacific Standard Time. Um, <laughs> so we will accept one question uh, from any of the attendees or um, from within the panel. Uh, and the next panel will be also extending um, its, its start time.
Any questions or thoughts? Well, first, I just want to say I love that I jumped on this panel late because I couldn't master asynchron asynchronicity. <laughs> um, and I just want to say that these three presentations have go together so beautifully. It feels that it was predestined. I love, I love how uh, St Stacey, you're talking about Tanya being put into a position of you know being beyond her years, uh, while at this very same moment that that the Laurel Canyon singer-songwriters are uh, adopting this affect of, of being younger than their years. And then, and then Evie is similar period because Greece, of course, as a stage musical debuts in 1971. So I wondered if either of you had thought about how general attitudes about the child at that time, both in terms of a figure, um, as Carl Wilson said in the, in the comments, uh, you know, there was sort of this fear that through the counterculture, the children were taking over. Although I would argue that by the early 70s, that had shifted a bit. Um, and then secondly, in my obsession, um, which is self-help and the emergence of the inner child through uh, popular tomes like Games People Play, also uh, a country song, <laughs> uh, I'm Okay, mm -hmm. You're Okay. And uh, I found one called Your Inner Child of the Past from 1962, uh, actually. But anyway, there's I'm Okay, You're Okay. So I wonder if you, how you see all these things connecting. I think one of the things that you was, uh, was really important that you brought up was uh, Bill, Bill Weather and Labor mm -hmm. uh, about working class. And I, this is going to get me in a little trouble, I think, but I always found the sort of Laurel Canyon scene. Well, I, mean, I always found a little, a little sort of indulgent. I've always been like, like that. Tanya Tucker thought of it as la as labor, right? Like that she was forced to labor by her father, and mm -hmm. so she didn't examine her childhood because she had to work. Um, and and so I'm always curious about that sort of like. I'm wondering if the possibility of reflecting on inner childhood or the possibility of constructing an inner child is a kind of bourgeois indulgence that can be paid for when children don't have to work. Mm. I mean, I think it's a good idea. I don't think children should work, <laughs> but I'm really curious about that. Yeah. And you can see that in Jackson too, right? Okay, like, about I was thinking about time. your talk and, and comparing like. Stevie yeah. Wonder to, to Michael yeah. Jackson in the same capacity. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, one thing that's interesting if you look at the literature of childhood and um, perhaps there are people who study this in this room, but um, there is always this tension between the kind of Dickensian uh, social justice portrayal of children as, uh, you know, being victimized by having to work and, and then the idyllic uh, solitary child who's more isolated and, and they combine and, and, and sort of confront each other in different ways throughout this trope throughout uh, history. And I wonder how that works in musicals too, Evie, because um, I don't know, like I'm thinking about one thing that happens in Dirty Dancing is that, that Jennifer Grey, she's, it's not like she has to work, but she enters the working class world yeah, uh, as we know, she's on her way to Mount Holyoke in the fall, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's you know, there's a couple things I was going to say. Like, this is less from the from like an artist or or the filmmaker's perspective, but a one of the things is I'm the perfect age for these to have like really deeply affected me, and I think that, like I sort of touched on a little bit, um, the being you know now in my 40s, kind of examining this whole sort of. Um, range of of art that's like this it really like I really kind of tapped into um to what not only what it meant to me but like what it means to um to young women and adolescent girls like at an incredibly important time in their life and like I think it you know and, and I've sort of come to the conclusion that that any art that's created for them is is kind of subversive by definition in a way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's obviously going to be some that are going to have like regressive ideas and um, and things that that <laughs> are not necessarily what you want to expect them to, but expose them to. But there's so much that just by like centering their stories is um, is uh, you know really kind of radical in a way. And so I, I've been looking at, at all of this from that and kind of 
my own inner child about like what would what would have changed if I had been exposed as a kid to some of like the 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 more like modern and more explicitly kind of like progressive um, progressive art like this and. Uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know if that exactly answers your questions, but with the musicals, like they are, I mean, I think one of the thing about musicals is that they are like ensemble pieces. And so it's different than like what, what so much um, of like children's literature and music and everything is, which is like that kind of solitary journey or whatever. So it is, right. it's a very, they are collective in a way that I think um, makes it, uh, makes it a lot, like it gives it its own uh, power, especially when you're thinking about like the fact that people, th that the viewers and the listeners are doing it collectively as well. Like, you know. Right, like in Greece you have, you know, I mean, obviously there is the weird thing of all film musicals where these 35 year olds are playing teenagers, <laughs> but like Kanicki, Jeff Conaway's uh, character is a mechanic, right? In fact, right. They all, aren't the, doesn't John Travolta's character also work in the shop? But yeah. it's like working high school kids and then, yep. the, you know, the richer kids who don't work. So I think there's class tension, just, right. as, just as in a lot of um, children's literature, there is this tension. Uh, in The Secret Garden, for example, you have three different children, all of whom are almost emblematic of uh, different ways of being a child, a, a sick child, yeah. a, a kind of coddled girl child, and then uh, and then a working free, a free working class boy, Dickens. Yeah. One, one thing, I know I have to wrap up, but one thing that I didn't have time to talk about was I wanted to talk a little bit about Frenchie and who tries to drop out of school in order to go to beauty school. And right, it, this right. is like her dream, but it turns out she sucks at it. And the whole like beauty school dropout thing, I, I like I was watching it again last night and he's just like, you know, you don't have to follow your dreams. You can just like stay a kid and like right. just be in school, you know, regular school for a while. Like sometimes following your dreams is not actually the thing to do. And, you know, and you can be more yourself. And right. um, and so th I think that's a big piece of it, too, because that's, you know, she's trying to be a working girl and um, it's just, you know. Uh, she's they're still working class, but you know, it, it's not necessarily the right thing for her to go off on her own. So yeah. And well, just pointing there quickly you back have to it. Stacey, the working <laughs> the working class kid is a figure in country music, I think, throughout the history of country music. So the working class child. Okay. I was gonna say there you have it. Kids, you don't have to follow your dreams. And, um, <laughs> that is the takeaway. <laughs> Definitely, I am getting Especially getting, if you suck at what you're trying to do. Don't yes. try to just move on. <laughs> I'm definitely getting an age drag tattoo also. Um, age after, drag. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is great. Uh, so just FYI to everybody here in this room, the other panel has already started in the um, Zoom room. Zoom room two or Zoom room one, whichever the other one is. So uh, please head over there. And um, I see there are there is a question from Jody Rosen for Anne. Um, <laughs> if you could take that offline, that would be great. So we can keep things Always. moving. Um, unfortunately, thank you, Jody. Yeah. Um, anyways, thank you so much. Uh, please continue to enjoy the programming. Uh, we've worked hard on it, and I'm glad we can all be together virtually. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. JD. Great moderating. Thank you. <laughs>